All right, so uh, first week of the course of Math 340, we're talking about exponential and logarithmic functions this week. Um, and uh, just a, a quick little aside. So you may notice that um, if you read the student learning outcomes for this course, there's a, a bit in there about reviewing exponential and logarithmic functions, which is what we're doing right now. Um, our textbook doesn't include any of this material, any of this review material. It kind of jumps right in, assuming you already know all of this stuff. Um, so this is kind of a supplemental lecture that you're not going to see in the book. And because of that, the assignment for this week is going to be a worksheet uh, as opposed to stuff that's assigned out of the textbook because there is no problem set in the textbook for this. So this is kind of uh, like the, the only week that we're doing something that's not directly from our textbook, but starting next week and on, on from there for the rest of the course, we'll be working out of our, our, out of our book as far as homework and things like that goes. Um, this is all review. So this is all material that you would have covered in a uh, college algebra course um, there's nothing in here that should be, uh, you know, brand new to you. But at the same time, uh, some of this, it may have been a little while since you've seen it. So it's worth doing the review because we we do a lot with these types of functions in calculus. Um, so that's all the disclaimer I think I need to give right now. Let's start with the topic of an exponential function. So an exponential function is any function that has this form to it. F of x equals some constant b to a variable power x. These are different from power functions where the variable is here and the constant is here. Um, don't confuse this with a power function. Those are two different things. But we will deal with power functions a lot in this course as well. Um, furthermore, uh, there's a restriction that we put on this constant b here. It has to be positive, and we're going to assume that it's not equal to 1. And there's, there's a few reasons for why that's the case. Uh, first of all, um, these exponents up here as we're going to talk about in just a moment, they can represent radicals uh, depending on what x is equal to. So for example, if I put a one-half in there for x, that means the square root of b. That's the literal interpretation of it. If we allow b to be a negative number, then whenever we plug in one-half for x, we're taking the square root of a negative number. That's where we get into the, ter the territory of imaginary numbers, complex numbers, things like that. And we don't talk about those types of numbers in this class. Calculus, as far as we are concerned for this class, is restricted to the real numbers. So it doesn't make sense for b to be negative. Furthermore, if b is either 0 or 1, then raising it to any power, uh, except for the 0 to the power of 0, is just going to give us either that 0 or that 1 that we put in that base there. So those are not interesting functions. or Those are technically constant functions, and there's nothing uh, worth you know, discussing as far as those are concerned. So we're, we're only going to define these for where b is a positive number that's not equal to 1. So if this is a, a, an exponential function, we have a couple of names for the pieces of these things. That b there, we call that the base of the exponential. The x is called the exponent. And then whenever I plug a positive integer in for uh, x here, Whatever the result of this is, we call that a power of b. So for example, I can say that 8 is a power of 2, because 2 to the third power equals 8. So I can find an integer power of 2 that gives me 8. That's basically what that's saying. Sorry, I'm a little stuffy right now. I'm just getting over a cold. Um, so exponential functions show up all over the place, um, and this is uh, a calculus for business and economics course. Uh, exponential functions show up in those specific applications a lot, a whole lot. And we'll get into um, uh, a specific application in a little bit, but let's let's go all the way back to a basic understanding of what exponents are, because that's how we're going to interpret uh, the result of this thing for different values of x that we plug in. So a good starting point is um, what, what it means for uh, us to take a number b and raise it to a, a power x where x is some positive integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, you know, our counting numbers. The literal interpretation of that is that we take b and multiply it to itself however many times that exponent is indicating. So b to the fifth power means b times b times b times b times b. That's five b's all multiplied together. 
Um, that's like, you know, you learn that all the way back in elementary school. And then what happens if B is negative? So if, if this X here is a positive number, then putting a minus in front of it makes it a negative. And we interpret negative exponents as the reciprocal of just, in this case, B to the negative X would be the reciprocal of B to the X. So here's uh, a de uh, an interpretation for that. Really important thing to remember from this is that raising a number to a negative exponent does not make that number negative. This is not negative. Neither is this. So uh, all it does is it gives you the reciprocal of that b to the x there. If x is equal to 0, then we define b to that power, b to the power of 0, to always equal 1. Um, and that's that's always the case regardless of what B is as long as we're talking about B with these restrictions on it. Okay, <clears throat> so um, that accounts for all of the integers, positive, negative, and zero. What if X is a rational number? Remember, a rational number is a number that can be represented as a fraction whose numerator and denominator are both integers. So let's suppose X is a rational number. Let's say it's equal to C over D. And you'll notice in the parentheses here, I say where C and D are integers whose greatest common factor is one. Basically what that means is that this fraction has already been simplified. Um, an example of a fraction that is that does not have this is something like um, three ninths, for example. Three and nine have a greatest common factor of three, not one. But three ninths can be simplified to one third. So I'm making the assumption here that this fraction is already simplified. And if it's not, you can simplify it. Um, but if x is a rational number, c over d, then we interpret uh, an exponent to where that's equal to this as uh, involving a radical. So b to the power of c over d is the same thing as the dth root of b to the power of c. So my numerator becomes an exponent, and my denominator gives me the index on this radical. That's what that number is called, index. Okay? The only type of real number that we haven't accounted for yet is irrational numbers. Remember, irrational numbers are numbers that can't be represented by fractions, you know, integer over integer like this. But that's fine because we actually do have the ability to define irrational powers. Unfortunately, giving a thorough definition of what that means is beyond the scope of this course. It actually involves limits of sequences, which is a, a calculus topic. Um, so we're just going to take advantage of the fact that this is defined when x is an irrational number, even though we're not going to be able to make much sense of it um, computationally at this point. So basically what that means is that b to the x is defined for all real numbers, rational and irrational. That accounts for all of the real numbers. So we would say that the domain of the exponential function, or an exponential function, is the set of all real numbers. In interval notation, we can write that this way, ne negative infinity to positive infinity. Um, the range of a... Uh, <clears throat> of an exponential function. Remember, domain is the set of all possible inputs for a function. Everything I'm allowed to plug in for x. The range is the set of all possible outputs. What can come out of this function? Well, uh, this little paragraph here is kind of logically working through what the range would have to be, and it's not all real numbers this time. So if you notice, in all of the uh, different meanings behind the exponent, depending on whether that exponent is a positive integer, negative integer, zero, rational, we couldn't really go into a discussion of irrational, but basically all of these definitions, none of them will take a positive number b, raise it to any of those possible powers, and produce anything other than a positive number. So... This does not produce negative numbers. We also can't raise b to any power and get a zero out of it. It's only positives that come out of this. Furthermore, we can get any positive out of an exponential function because uh, you, by taking your exponent uh, to be larger and larger positive numbers, we can get b to that power to get as large as we want it to be. And if we take x to be very, very small. So if we let X be something like negative a billion or negative a trillion, by small I mean, you know, negative, like very far in the negative direction, um, then 
we get a reciprocal of one over some very, very large positive number. This gives me something very, very close to zero. So I can make any positive number out of an exponential function, whether as big as I want it to be or as close to zero as I want it to be. And what that means is that the range of uh, this exponential function is the set of all oh, ranges down here. It's the set of all positive real numbers, not just real numbers. In interval notation, we'd write that this way, the interval from zero to infinity, okay? <clears throat> so this is like way, way back in your, um, in your math education that you learn about all of that stuff. So now what I want to do is start looking at graphs of uh, exponential functions. We're going to start with this example right here, y equals 2 to the x. So remember, when you first learn about new functions, if you're going to graph a function, it's, it's helpful to plot some points. Now, I already gave you what the graph looks like over here, but if I hadn't given you this, we'd want to fill out a table, get some points, and then kind of connect the dots. So 2 to the power of negative 2. It's not going to give me a negative number. We already know that. It, the negative tells me to take a reciprocal. It becomes 1 over 2 to the second power, which is 4. So I get 1 fourth from that. Similar here, if I take 2 to the negative 1 power, that just gives me the reciprocal of 2, which is 1 half. <coughs> Excuse me. We know that taking any number to the power of 0 is always 1. Any number to the power of 1 is itself 2 to the first power, and 2 to the second power, or 2 squared, is 4. Okay, you can find these values here. So, for example, negative 2, when I plug that in, gives me, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 1 fourth, which looks like that's about right, based on what this graph is showing me. Negative 1 gives me 1 half, right there in the middle, and so on and so forth. You can identify the points that we just plotted on this graph here. Connecting the dots gives me this curve. So a couple of observations we want to make about this particular exponential function when we graph it. For one thing, it's what we call an increasing function. <clears throat> what that means is that as we go from left to right, so in other words, as our x values get larger and larger, the y values of those points that we're uh, getting from those x values is also getting larger and larger. So in other words, as x increases, y also increases. We call that an increasing function. Um, so uh, the increasing and decreasing functions have important properties, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the course, but that's an important thing to, to make note of. Not only is it increasing, but the uh, slope of this thing, if you think of this as like a, the steepness, if you think of this as a hill or something like that, it starts off relatively not that steep here, but it looks like it's gradually getting steeper and steeper as we move towards the right here. What, that in, it, what we interpret that to mean is that this function is increasing at an increasing rate as, we, uh, as x gets bigger and bigger. We'll make more sense of that later in the course as well. <clears throat> um, anytime we want to model a real-world phenomenon with a function that does this, an exponential function that increases like this. We call that exponential growth, okay? So that comes up a fair amount in this course. I want to look at a different exponential function. This time, y equals one-third to the x. I'm going to fill out this table, but see if you can see where I'm getting these values from. This would give me 9, 3, 0, 1 third, 1 ninth. Okay, these values are relatively easy to come up with, but I'm going to let you figure out where those are coming from. Um, you, can you can find all of those points on this curve right here. Notice as x gets bigger, y is actually getting smaller now. It's not getting bigger anymore. And so my function is going downhill as I go from left to right, which is the opposite of what we saw in the previous example. In this case, we would say that this is a decreasing function. So as x gets larger, y is getting smaller now. <clears throat> um, exponential functions can have this property as well. And when they do, if we're going to model some real-world phenomenon with a function, an exponential function that decreases like this, we would say that that phenomenon has exponential decay. 
exponential growth and exponential decay show up in all kinds of different applications, not just in business and economics, but in biology and uh, physics and all sorts of different things. So these are important terms. Um, there, you might look at this and think like, what, what was it that caused the previous example to give me an increasing function, whereas this one gave me a decreasing function? And the answer was the base. The only thing that was different was the base. So in, in the previous example, I had two to the x, and here I have one third to the x. It turns out we can generalize these two observations to know when an exponential function is increasing and when it's decreasing. Specifically, y equals b to the x is increasing anytime b is greater than 1 and decreasing anytime b is between 0 and 1, which was what we had in this previous example here. So we get exponential growth in this case, decay in this case. Okay? All right. So now I want to look at an application. And because this is a calculus for business and economics course, it makes sense to take an application from finance. Um, so we're going to look at compound interest. Again, this is something that you would have talked about um, at length in a previous course, something like a pre-calculus uh, pre or a college algebra type course. Um, so <clears throat> let's quickly go through this. Uh, so suppose that you want to make a, a one-time investment in some kind of account that acc uh, accrues interest. Um, that one-time investment we're going to call P, capital P, which stands for principal. That's what that initial uh, deposit or investment is called. Let's suppose also that the account earns interest at an annual rate. It's important that we make sense of the word annual here. Annual rate R, where this R is going to be given as a decimal. So in parentheses here, I give an example. If R is equal to 0.04, that, is, that corresponds to a 4% interest rate. Um, we're also going to suppose that the interest is compounded n times per year. What that means is that we're calculating that interest n times per year per year. Now you might ask, how can you take an annual rate, an annual interest rate, and calculate it against a principal more than one time per year? Wouldn't that mean it's not annual anymore? Well, the way that we do that is if we're um, compounding our interest n times, we take that rate and we divide it by n, and we use that as the, as the rate that we're calculating throughout the year. So r over n is like taking that rate for the year and splitting it up into n parts, and then at equal intervals throughout the year, we compound that interest, we add that interest in. Kind of the primary difference between compound interest and simple interest is that compound interest um, <clears throat> calculates the interest based on what the current account balance is. So this interest is not always a percent of just the principal by itself. It's also calculated against the principal plus whatever interest has already been accumulated. So every time this is, this is evaluated or, or computed, it's giving you a little bit more because there's a larger account balance if it keeps growing like that. Um, okay, so uh, let's suppose that we have this you know, information here and we want to determine what the account balance A is going to be after the first compounding interval. Well, we have our principal P already in the account. And then we're going to multiply P by R over N because that would give me the percent of P that is uh, what I'm getting in interest, in that first, that first computation of interest. So A would equal my initial principal plus the interest that I'm getting, P times R over N, that rate. And if I factor the P out of this, I get P times 1 plus R over N. So I can think of this as what my account balance will be. Now, um, that's great. Um, but what if I want to find how much is in my account after the second compounding interval? Well, it turns out that every time we want to compound interest, we just need to multiply by another factor of 1 plus R over N. So there's already P times 1 plus R over N in my account. I'm going to multiply that by another 1 plus R over N. But a better way of writing this is P times 1 plus R over N to the second power, because I've done that now twice. Um, in fact, this is now easy to generalize. Suppose we um, have compounded our uh, compounded interest on this account k times in total. 
that 2 there is just going to become a k in this more general case. a is equal to p times 1 plus r over n to the power of k. And you can see where the exponential function stuff is going to show up. That exponent is, is directly coming from the total number of times I'm compounding interest. Typically, though, in a compound interest problem, we don't say, you know, interest has been compounded this many times. We'll say interest is compounded this many times per year, and here's how many years have passed. So we don't want to use k explicitly. Instead, what we want to do is figure out how many times interest would have been compounded after a total of t years. Um, if it's n times per year that interest is compounded, then k in that case would be just, just be n times t, or the number of times per, per year we compound our interest times the number of years we're looking at. So instead of k, we're going to write an nt right there. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, we're going to do one quick example before we end this video, and then in the next video we'll move on to um, how to how to take this idea into something that we call continuously compounded interest. So starting with this one, you make a, a one-time deposit of $3,500 in an account that accumulates interest at an annual rate of 6.5% compounded quarterly. Determine the, the account balance after eight years. So here, what we're going to do is figure out uh, the, the different um, inputs for these different unknowns here so we can get something that we want to compute. So we need a P, we need R, we need N, which shows up in two places, and we need a T, okay? From our description, what are these, these four values? Well, P is the principal. That's the initial one-time deposit that we make, $3,500. And then we have R. R is the rate, so the rate in this case was 6.5%, but as a decimal, that would be 0 0.065. Have to make sure it's a decimal first. N is the number of times we are compounding interest each year. The keyword here is quarterly. That means four times per year. So N is four in this case. And then finally, T, how many years are we looking at? Well, it says eight years, so that's going to be an eight. At this point, I'm just plugging things into this function. Now, if you notice here, I went from calling this a up here to a of t, because in a problem, p, r, and n are all fixed values. t is the one thing that can be changing. I can, I can talk about the account balance after different numbers of years. Um, so we think of this as a function of t. In this case, I'm looking at a of 8, because that's the number of years. So that's equal to P, which was 3,500, times 1 plus my rate, 0 0.065, over N, which was 4, to the power of N, which again, that's 4, times T, which was 8, okay? This just goes into a calculator. I'm not expecting anybody to do this kind of thing by hand. Use a calculator. That's what they're there for. In fact, I'm not going to say equals. I'm going to say is approximately because this is going to come out to a very long, in fact, a non-terminating decimal. But I'm going to say that this, after putting it into a calculator, is approximately 5,862.54. Now, it makes sense to round this to two decimal places because it's a dollar amount. So this is dollars and cents. Let me put a dollar sign there. So... That's what our account balance would be after those eight years, okay? So that's going to be it for this video. We'll continue working with these ideas in the next one.